Hi, I'm Jalen Rose, and welcome to the Renaissance Man podcast, proudly presented by the New York Post, a show where we cover trends in fashion, entertainment, current events, and everything in between. If you recently been to Times Square, you had no choice but to see my next guest plastered everywhere. He's a legendary rapper, songwriter, and has bars, bars, bars for anybody all time in the game. Now he's been appointed the head of hip hop at TuneCore and is already hard at work in his new executive role. He's scouting rising talent and helping them find their path like he did his and much more. It is my honor to welcome my brother, the incredible Papoose, to the Renaissance Man. What up, though? Peace, man. Yo, thanks for that intro. I don't know if I can live up to it, man, but thank you, brother. <laughs> well deserved. Well deserved. You know, I got love for you. I'm a huge fan of yours. And before I get started, I want to make sure that the world knows I'm going to dedicate, we're going to dedicate this episode to the legendary Drama King, hey, DJ K Slay. Yes, man. I appreciate that. That's love, bro. Real Absolutely. Talk. No question about it. And, and I know your background, but I want the audience to get familiar with you. Before we dive into your new role of helping rising artists, tell our audience when you started carving out your role as an artist growing up in Brooklyn. Definitely, man. Man, growing up in Brooklyn, I, I always, to be honest with you, it was always my dream to become an artist since I was a kid, just watching the greats like Big Daddy Kane and, and all of these artists on Video Music Box, you know what I'm saying? And one day I said, you know what, I'm going to try to write me a rhyme. And I, I wrote one and I, I went to school, I, I said it to my friends, and when I got that reaction, from, from that moment right there, I said, that's what I want to do with my life. And um, I just started perfecting my craft over the years. And, um, man, it, it wasn't easy to get in the game, though. Mm -hmm. So um, I started selling CDs. I, I, I pressed up my own CD. I started selling them out the trunk of my car. And I had heard a DJ on the radio, and he was doing something real interesting to me because at that time, if you wasn't on Rockefeller, Rough Rider, or Murder, mm -hmm. Inc., you wasn't getting in the, in the, in the music mm -hmm. business. Just no wasn't, you wasn't going to make no name for yourself. But this DJ caught my attention because he was playing new artists on the radio. So I was like, yo, I got to meet this dude, man. So I went and um, I looked up Hot 97 address and I went to the radio. And by the way, that was DJ K Slay. No. Rest, in, rest in peace to Slay. And I, I had my CD and I just waited for him at the radio. And I gave him my CD. The first time he, he didn't play it on the radio, but I was consistent. I came back week after week. I came back and... um. Eventually, me and him got into it because he got tired of me bothering him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got tired of him not playing my CD. And in the process of that altercation, the person he was with, he mediated it. He said, yo, don't worry, I got you. And then I was back in the hood in Brooklyn, discouraged and going through different trials and tribulations. And in the middle of a situation, my phone rang. And it was Case Clay. He said, you're on the radio next week. Wow. The rest of history. That's dope. Case Slay, not only... A legendary DJ for those that don't know. One of the great ears for the street and for the culture. Always kept his ears to the ground. Always was about discovering new talent and always holding everybody accountable. And he ain't a little dude. So tell yep. me about encountering him and doing what you needed to do to earn his respect. Yeah, man. I, yo, I was so hungry at the time, bro. And you you right. Slay no little dude, man. But I was so <laughs> hungry. I didn't even care, bro. I was like, yo, I need to get on. I need to get off these Brooklyn streets, man. I got. I know I got the talent because I was battling in the street and it was like a cheat code. You know what I'm saying? Like, we used to make money just, yo, yo, from battling my man. And I used to kill cats. So I just, I was so ambitious. I was like, I don't even care. I need to meet this dude because I never heard nobody play new artists on the radio. Mm -hmm. I can't even believe I'm hearing this. So when I first had that encounter with him, man, it didn't go well, man, because when I initially gave him the CD, my young mind, I'm like, okay, I gave a DJ that's on the radio my CD. I'm going to be on the radio. So I went back to Brooklyn and I'm listening. 
and I don't hear my song. I'm like, yo, what the <laughs> heck? I ain't playing my damn song. Like, I know my shit's hot. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go back next week, and I'm going to go back. And every time I did it, he didn't play it. So I said, I know what I'm going to do. This time when I get this dude my CD, I'm not leaving. I'm going to wait downstairs. <laughs> if he don't play it, he's going to have to explain to me why. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in the car, and I'm listening. He only on for two hours. He go off at 2 a.m. It's like 1.58 or 1.55 or whatever, and I still hear my song. So I call up on the radio. I'm like, yo. Why you ain't play? Why you ain't play my song? And he knew who I was, bro. He knew he me. He said, "Yo, listen, man. Everybody can't be a rapper. Some people gotta be a fireman." <laughs> <laughs> so I said, "Yo, I said that's it. It's lit when this dude come downstairs, man." So he came down, and I went at him. He went at me, and dude stepped right in the middle of us. And for some reason, I believed him. He was like, "Yo, I got you," mm-hmm. and I just fell back, man. And, like I said, man, when I was back in the hood, man, I got that phone call from Slay. Mm-hmm. And when he brought me on the radio, rest in peace, Prodigy was up there. And we all was rapping on the air. Yo, the rest was history, man. Me and Slay, that became my brother, my mentor. We did so much together. We ended up getting a $1.5 million record deal uh, with Job Records, man. That was crazy. Oh, and that's why, for so many reasons, you're the perfect person to be in the position that you are in now. Because... You got it from the trunk. You got it from the mud. Not only freestyling, selling, and pressing CDs, but the work ethic, the discipline to keep going back to the radio station, to keep writing your rhymes, keep paying your dues. So what was it like for you once you got that $1.5 million deal? Man, when me and Slay started rocking, we like we was terrorizing the street, man. I'm talking about we was dropping mixtape after mixtape. I was doing a lot of things that signed artists were doing, but I wasn't signed yet. A lot of people don't know that during that whole period of time when me and Slay was working, I was unsigned. Mm. And then I ended up getting on a record with uh, Buster Rhymes, a touchy remix. It was Buster, Mary, mm. um, DMX, Miss Yelly. I ended up getting on that record, and that made it even worse for cats. So they really hated me back then. No doubt. And I was just killing, sh- killing, sh- grinding. And eventually, and Slay was just threatening the labels on every mixtape. Like, yo, y'all better hurry up and sign them. I don't know what y'all hating for. <laughs> and it's, it's, it, a bidding war started. You know what I'm saying? Nas reached out to me. I sat down with Nas at a, at a pizza shop in Lower Manhattan. And he was going to Def Jam with Jay-Z at the time. He made an offer. And um, Interscope made an offer. It was a couple different labels who showed interest in me. You know what I'm saying? Back then, me and Swiss oh, almost did some. Swiss reached out. But Job came in with the highest number, which was 1.5 million. It was crazy because I had did a freestyle, and I and I said at the end of the freestyle, the 1.5 million dollar man. And Slay was like, "Yo, Pap, you gotta change that, man." Like, I'm like, "Yo, what, man? Like, what's wrong?" He like, "Oh, man, nah, man, just change it." And, and I didn't have the deal yet, mm. and I changed it. And then the next week, they came with that offer, 1.5 million dollars, bro. And um, to answer your question. It was actually one of the worst mistakes I ever made, man, because I lost creative control. They started trying to tell me how to make records. They were upset that I was jumping. All the things that I was doing when I was independent, the label would complain because I would always, if someone made a record, I would do my version of it and put it out. And that that would put me on tour. That would keep me on the road doing shows because people wanted to hear my version of it. And they they just would be complaining about it and, um, Oh, and then when it was time for me to make the record, my single, and they would have so be overpinionated. So the mm. creative control, it kind of messed me up. And then eventually we ended up parting ways with them because of that. We just kept bumping heads too many times. It was a bunch of other moving parts. And I, I, in hindsight, I wish I would have stayed independent, mm-hmm. which I am now with TuneCorp because I would have never, my career wouldn't have got put to a hold for a minute. You know what I'm saying? So everything happened for a reason, but I was happy to sign that. So don't let me say it. I was happy to sign that one point five million dollar deal, man. But eventually, it was a mistake. And, and 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 as a fan of yours, I saw that happen. They put the handcuffs on you. Like mm-hmm. what made you who you are is was battling, freestyling, and your your versatility and flexibility and your creativity. And yeah. once you got with the label. They were like, make these sort of type songs so we could get you on the radio, so we mm-hmm. could get you on this sort of remix. And then I felt like your deal almost became a target. 
that yeah. people was like jealous that you got the bread and mm -hmm. then you went to the label and you were kind of handcuffed with your creativity. How did you feel throughout that process? Man, it was it was very frustrating, man, at the time. Like everything that could go pos that could possibly go wrong went wrong around that time. You know what I'm saying? I was young. I was fresh out of Brooklyn. I had to I had a somewhat of a uh I would say I won't say ignorant, but I had the mentality, it was all I knew. I had the mentality of because like you said, a lot of people was jealous that I had that deal. Yeah. So a lot of hate and obstacles were getting put in my way. So in my young mind at that time, if someone gets to my way, we're gonna go Brooklyn on them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's what that's what we was doing, to be honest with you. Because dudes was hating on me, bro. And the fans love me, the people embrace me, but certain people in positions of power, they were just doing a lot of hating from behind the scenes. And I dealt with it the wrong way. I should have ignored it and stayed focused on my craft, but instead I entertained it. That made things worse because that started to give me a bad name. Like, mm -hmm. oh, this dude is doing X, Y, right. Z. You know what I'm right. saying? And, and you can't mix the streets with the right. industry. You can't. Right. A lot of dudes think you can do it. You're going to pay. It's a big mistake. So I had to learn that. So I blame myself. I don't blame the haters back then. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they were hating on me and I reacted in the in an ignorant way. You know what I'm saying? And that, that contributed to my demise at that time. You know, also around that time, my wife blew trial. So I kind of lost my my drive. I'm like, you know what? I got to support her. I mm -hmm. was just busy. Uh, she was even telling me, oh, you got to get back to work. And I was like, I don't care right now. I was just supporting her for a long period of time. So my deal folded. My mm -hmm. wife blew trial. So, you know, I had to start all over again, bro. And now, 15 years later, you and the queen, Remy Ma, get a chance to celebrate your marriage with the golden child. Congratulations, my brother. Thank Talk you, about bro. the progression of you guys' relationship because the one thing about being public figures is we get a chance to see you guys happy and celebrating on the red carpet, suited and booted, but we also get a chance to see you guys go through turbulence. So just talk about what it's been like over those 15 years having a high-profile relationship but still being able to maintain your loyalty and love. Yeah, definitely, man. I mean, you know, we, we, we took it one day at a time always. You know, my wife being incarcerated, I don't want to say it was a blessing in disguise, but one of the things it taught us was communication. Mm. I feel like a lot of relationships fail because the, the communication isn't there. Mm -hmm. But when she was away, all we could do was talk. You know what I mean? When I, would, when I would go visit her, they would say, put your hands on the table. And even if we did have a disagreement, we came up with, because our time was so limited. Mm -hmm. And we came up with this, with this system that whenever she's speaking, I got to be totally quiet. Whenever mm -hmm. I'm speaking, she has to be totally quiet you can't respond you can't Love say anything. and in the process of doing that i realized that you know because sometimes when two people are getting into it and you feel like you're right and that person feels like they're right it can really lead to something real bad because you're yeah. passionate about your feeling but when yeah. you actually listen to a person talk you realize damn i didn't mean to make you, i didn't mean it like that i didn't know i made you feel mm -hmm. that way so mm -hmm. you'll actually see where you was wrong at yeah. because none of us are perfect you know what i'm saying so with, within us doing that that built our level of communication. So with that communication, man, regardless of what happens, we're always able to talk through it. So when we went on Love and Hip Hop and went on television and all that, it was nothing they can put in front of us that can cause a, a bad shit. So we was already right. built, built <laughs> tough. We done right. survived the tornado, the hurricane. Right. Hey, you know what I'm saying? With her being away, it, it, it was difficult, but we, we got through it. And um, we took that with us into the industry, man. And we always use that. So I think that's what keeps us going just that communication and, and that loyalty. I love that so very much. And as an artist that's done so many songs, so many freestyles, so many features, so many different times you've rhymed on the mic, can you remind me of one of your favorite ciphers? The time you looked around and was like, he's here, she's here, they're here, I'm here, and that was historic. Oh, man, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I would have to say it was the BET Award where we did the Touch It remix. It was Lloyd Banks. Mm. It was myself, Buster. Mm. Um, DMX wasn't there live, but he's on the record. Mary, Missy, everybody. But then Eminem came out on the damn stage with us mm. and did his verse. Mm. That was a moment where I looked around like somebody pinched me. Am I dreaming? Like wow. it, it, it was great, and then 
what me that made it more crazy was the responses I got from back home. I felt like I hit the winning home run at the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> like it was, no doubt. That, that was a moment, bro, where I looked around like, damn, I made it, man. What about this alphabetical slaughter mm -hmm. that was something that was so very unique to you and your style that almost has become historic, like yeah. something we want you to continue to do each year? <laughs> yo, yo, let me tell you something about alphabetical slaughter, bro. No matter where I travel to on the planet, what country, they know that song more than they know me. They like, yo, mm. have alphabetic. And it's crazy because I, I created it so long ago. And so many MCs try to recreate it, and it, it never works, bro. <laughs> but um, when I was young, I had read that Malcolm X read the entire dictionary. Oh. And I was like, wow, I want to try that. So I went and got the, the uh, Webster Third World Third World, Third World College Edition Dictionary. I'll never forget it. Mm. And I read the whole dictionary. But in the process wow. of me reading it, I caught the idea. I said, yo, I could do an alphabet song. So mm -hmm. I, I, I said, I sat there, I went through the bit, and I created it. I only had three letters. I had it from A to C. And how I knew it was crazy, because I would be in the streets battling, and if a cat didn't tap out, I would do alphabetical slaughter. And they'd be like, oh, battle over. <laughs> <It's> over. <laughs> So I was like, yo, I got to finish this shit. And I just locked in in the crib and I, I finished it. And when I tell you, man, that shit became a classic, bro. Like to this day, people, that's all they talk about, man. It, it, and it is a classic. And I have to also acknowledge one of my favorite things about Instagram and social media is seeing you sitting in the car like you are right now <laughs> delivering bars, bars, bars. And normally, as a fan, you have to, like, wait for somebody to, like, put out a mixtape, mm -hmm. put out an album. It just seemed like you wake up and be like, you know what? I'm about to jump in the car and I'm about to rhyme. <laughs> so where did your love for the game become so much? It's almost like an athlete being ready to play in the league, but also willing to play pickup. Right, right. I, I tell you. You got to understand, I come from the CD era. I come from the mixtape era. So a lot of cats who come from that era, they got a little frustrated when the social media took over. But they made a mistake by doing that. I sat back one day and I said, yo, man, just got to adapt to it. Like, this is very useful because in all actuality, you can come up with an idea. And like you said, it was a process back then. You got to go in the studio. You got to record it. You got to get it mixed. Yeah. You gotta get samples cleared. You gotta press up the project. You gotta go through all these different things just to get your music to the people. So I'm looking at this Instagram thing one day and I'm like, yo, man, this is an advantage for a cat like me because mm -hmm. I love rapping, bro. I do it from the heart. Right. Just like how you you are with hooping, bro. Yes. Like, don't think I don't know who you are. Like, you crushed me through my childhood a bunch of <laughs> Thank times. Thank you, family. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? So I love the rap, bro. And I said, yo, to be honest with you, this is an advantage. You can actually you create something and get it right to your fans instantly. So I just turned on my phone, bro, while I was riding one day, and I said, you know, let me try it out. And I started seeing cats like yourself commenting. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I started getting so much love. I just I just became consistent with it, man. And, and the people always embrace it. It's mental exercise for me, man. I relieve stress through that. You yes. know what I mean? I, just, I, I enjoy it, bro. So if you don't mind, since you're sitting in the car, you're not at your <laughs> desk, I saw that you may have a single coming out, but I also saw that this may be your final one as you transition to your executive role. Mm -hmm. So before you make any of those moves, do you mind, since you're in the car, since you're in the gym, giving us a little snapshot of something fresh as it relates to some sort of freestyle? <laughs> All right. I'm from the style, son. Concrete full of cracks and dry gum. The whole reasonable doubt, big, ready to die slum. Dyslexic, ADHD, mentally blind, dumb. Bipolar of education, we was deprived young. Kids wear mm. Jordans before they could fit a size one. Timberland mm. boots with the trees from which we got hung. I got mm. bad nerves, always twiddling my thumbs. Feet tapping mm. the floor like I'm playing a live drum. People mm. that I trusted crossed me. Them guys done, the stab in the back was paralyzing. I'm numb. Nobody believe in life insurance where I'm from. Everybody got to chip in when somebody dies, son. Say you got mm -hmm. that drip. 
What happened when it dries, son? Brand new outfit of empty pockets, fly bums. I influenced Ooh. most of these rappers to really rhyme, son. Mm. Set a great example. I gave you power like Nas Gun. Who should I sign with? Adam, but just mm. remind them. You signing a beast like Fat Joe when he signed Pun. <laughs> you hear that, Drama King? You hear that, <laughs> Drama King? We got you, Drama King. Yeah, Straight right stun, we got you. We got you. <laughs> and now you're going to be sitting on the other side of the desk and people are going to be coming to you like you went to K Slay to try to be heard, to try yeah. to get opportunities, to try to get that deal. I want to make sure I shout out TuneCore. Y'all yeah. got it right. Y'all went to the block, to the street. Y'all got the intellect. Y'all got somebody that understands what we want to hear. And also, y'all now are going to be putting artists in position to own equity. Yeah. So can you talk about your new position with TuneCore? Break down what TuneCore is doing for rising artists and tell me why equity for artists is so very important to you. Yes, first and foremost, man, I want to say shout out to TuneCore. Just like you said, you said it best. They are brilliant. I love what they're doing, man. TuneCore is a distribution company. The best in the world, first and foremost. The most international. You know, a lot of these distributors, they, they distribute your music around the world, but they don't have what TuneCore has. TuneCore has 11 people on the head, on, on the ground. 11 heads on the ground in over 18 countries. Okay, across five continents, receiving, making sure your project is right and, and distributing it to different countries. And it's in great hands. You mm. keep 100% of your profit. These other wow. distributors, yes. These other distributors, they want to they want to do 80-20. They want to do 70-30. Some 60-40. It's ridiculous. There's mm. no way you should be in the studio, going through that studio therapy, uh, working hard on the road, and then you release music. You got to split your profit with someone. That's just not fair. With wow. TuneCore, you pay one fee, which is to upload your music, a fee of $10. We also have a new program where you can pay one annual fee and you can upload as many songs as you want through the entire year. Wow. And when I say upload, That's I dope. mean, yes, I mean upload to be released to the people. So to, to, the, to the digital platform. So TuneCore has no interest in the money that you make. That's your money. You only pay to upload as opposed to these other distributors. They're cutting into your money. So in the process of that, they're lying to you about what you actually made as an artist. Mm. I've had this experience and I've had other artists who had this also who have also had the same experience. Wow. So soon cause a blessing for that. And, and just with the equity, you know what I'm saying? You, you, you keep your own masters. You, know wow. what I'm saying? you keep your masters. All of that belongs to you. That's why I, I spoke about this from the heart. What happened to me was what I spoke about earlier. I had the $1.5 million deal. Mm -hmm. And then after that folded, you know what I'm saying, that, that went the way it went. I've worked with so many of these distributors, so I know how they work. And I didn't learn my own, my true value as an artist until I got with TuneCore. Mm. Because it wasn't until that moment that I was able to say, damn, I'm making the profit off my music. Because I'm going to tell you right now, as an artist, we don't even look forward to money that comes from record sales. We look forward to going to doing shows mm -hmm. or doing features because that's how they've trained us. They've trained us so well to not even look for that money because that's what they keep. Mm -hmm. So with TuneCore, I feel like as an artist, whatever your value is, you should cash cash in on that. Even if you're a new artist and you have a small fan base, if it's not a lot of money or if it's a lot of money, you should cash in on your true value. Yeah. So that's what TuneCore is all about. They put the artist first. And I became a part of it through my experience, not because they paid me to do anything, but no, they showed me that as, a, as an artist and someone who loves hip hop, that I can make money off my music instantly, straight into my bank account. And how you guys about to change the game, you're about to put people in position if they yeah. choose to, to do what Future just did. Or Dr. Dre just, Dr. Dre just sold his cattle off for $200 million. I've seen that, I've seen that, that's amazing. To, and, and to your point, and I saw TLC talk about the breakdown of them going diamond and basically each of them ended up with like $200,000. Mm. And to your point, they said they weren't even paying attention to record sales. They was trying to kill themselves doing shows just so they can pay their bills. I'm telling you, bro, 
that's how the industry is designed. They don't want you to look at some of them will give you an event and say, okay, oh here, don't worry. Until you recoup this, you don't make any profit. And every time you tap in, oh, you haven't recouped yet. And mm. then you say, okay, where's my dashboard so I can see the sales? You go into the dashboard and you're like, this is inaccurate. I know for a fact I sold more. They finger in the money for their own benefit. TuneCore mm. has no interest in your profit because they only make money for you uploading. So it's a mm -hmm. beautiful relationship that you can build as an artist. Monetize your YouTube. Stop giving these distributors the password to your YouTube so they can monetize it. Mm -hmm. See, TuneCore, we're not into that. That's why I'm saying these artists, man, do yourself a favor. Come to TuneCore today, man, and, and, and make become your own boss, bro. That is so dope. And in addition to this new role, and by the way, I hope that you don't get too busy to still do your freestyles on IG, <laughs> to still do more music. I know it's only 24 hours in the day, but I'm also <laughs> excited to talk about the release of your latest single, Making Plays. Yes, man. Tell yes. me about the new single with Jim I, Jones. Yes, yeah, got the new single coming. My brother Jim Jones, we're shooting a video tomorrow. It's called Ooh. Making Plays. And basically, you know, when we out here, sometimes we're going to do things to better our situation, you know what I mean, to make money, to be successful. We don't say that. We say, yo, I'm going to make this play real quick. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the title of the song. You know what I mean? It's the slang that we use, um, produced by Stan the Man, featuring Jock Quay on the, on the hook. Shout out to Jim Jones. We're shooting the, 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 movie, the video tomorrow. I almost said the movie. It's going to be a movie, man. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about that. And, and also at TuneCore, I'm doing so many things, man. I'm advising on brand strategies. Because a person oh, like me, bro, I've, I've just been on the artist side of it so long. I know what artists need. I yep. know some of the things they need in their arsenal. To, you know how it is, bro. Certain yep. things you need before you get on that court. Correct. Your mind, right. You know what I'm saying? So I know certain things that the artists need, man. I know what uh, how an artist thinks, and I know how hard it is. So I'm advising on brand strategies. I'm chiming in on different um technologies, different tools that artists can use to get their music to the people. So I'm also using my know-how and my experience, man, to, to make things better. And I'm looking for the next superstar at the same time. Absolutely. And again, TuneCore, y'all got the perfect person to do it. And whatever y'all paying him, y'all might as well add another <laughs> zero or two to it. Because <laughs> it's going to be worth it. I'm telling y'all right now, invest in my brother. But before I let you get out of here, I got a rapid fire segment called Gone in 60 seconds. You ready to do this? Let's do it. I try, bro. <laughs> Name as many artists from Brooklyn as you can. M.O.P. Um, Biggie Small, Jay-Z, J. Rue the Damager, Boot Camp Clip. Um, hmm, I can keep going. Smooth the Hustler and Trigger the Gambler. Mm. Have Poots. Mm. Fabulous. Um, man, uh, shout out to my brother Mayno from Brooklyn. Man, uh, it, it's it's a lot, man. Uh, most Dev Talib, Quali, AZ, the list goes on, man. That <laughs> list is crazy. That's why I had to ask you to do it. Just thinking that I list I is big, crazy. Right? I big, right? I said big, no right? doubt. And okay. by the, speaking of big, they need to get a statue of big in front of the arena where the Nets play. Mm -hmm. I'm standing on that. I've been talking about that for years that shit happened they used to have a a, a, a statue or like a, a, a fictional character i'm like man i need to be notorious so we working on that pal yo you ain't lying that would be crazy bro that because that, what, what brooklyn means to biggie bro it's not even i don't think nobody knows how to put it in you gotta be and that's no disrespect i'm honored that you said that you gotta be from brooklyn to understand what biggie means to that sidewalk if a person is from Brooklyn and they ask for their top five and they don't mention Big, I think something's wrong with them. Something is wrong with them. <laughs> and Brooklyn got so many artists. Just think about this. You forgot to mention Jay-Z. And I know that wasn't on purpose. That's no, how many y'all got. I said it. I said it. I think I okay, said it. Okay, <laughs> cool. Okay, cool. So I have to ask you this. If you can tell, because you started at 11 years old, if you could tell 11-year-old Pap anything right now, what would it be? Oh, man. Put out an album. Mm. Big, biggest mistake I made. When I got hot, let me tell you something, right? 
you look at all your favorite rappers. All of the, if you do your homework, their first their albums that the world consider classics, it was just all of their freestyles. They just mm. took them and went in the studio and got them produced and turned it into an album. But if mm. you really followed them and you seen them freestyling, you heard those same verses wow. on the album. So wow. what I should have did instead of just and I'm not I don't got no regret because I travel no the world to take care of my family, but I wish instead of just doing the mixtapes, I would have just did an album from the beginning. So mm-hmm. I would tell that that young kid, release an album before you do anything. This is the advice I give artists. Don't spew out too much of that energy. You need to bottle it up into that one classic. Mm-hmm. And you stay about your style. Fly coats, fly kicks, <laughs> fly jewels. Thanks. What is the flyest article of clothing or jewelry as you look back at your journey and was like, I was fresh that day. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, man. <laughs> Just me, man. Because I love the jacket. I love the jacket so much. It's crazy you said that because I just left uh, Jeff Hamilton. He makes the NBA leathers with all of the different designs. Ooh, yes. was, yeah. I had a Scarface one, man. Ooh. When I tell you this joint was be dazzled out, you know what I mean? I paid about three grand for it or whatever, but this joint was serious, man. <laughs> you pull up my video charade, you'll see that jacket, man. It was the day I had that Jeff Hamilton jacket. You know, I, I love that jacket, man. Dope, uh, dope. Name the Remy Ma song that will always be at the top of your list. Oh, my favorite song from Rim is When I See Her, man. You got this joint called When I See Her. I always tell her that. You, you ain't never going to top that, Burke. Man. Like, wow. That wow. joint, When I See Her, is my favorite, favorite Rim joint. Man. It's crazy. Seven months, and it's a problem when I see her. Seven days of the week, alternate sides of the street. I'm going to drag that <laughs> like a mother <laughs> It's crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, all love and blessings. In your new role, the sky is the limit for your potential. I'm rooting for you. Looking forward to breaking bread soon. Yo, bro, let me tell you this. It's an honor to have you come on my page and even comment, you know what I mean, on the things I be doing on my work. It's an honor to be talking to you. Thank growing you, Growing up, man, growing up, you was a dream shatterer, bro. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you gotta understand, I'm one of them New York dudes that they talk about. Like, I'm New York biased. So anything New York, I'm riding. You know what I'm saying? And like the rest of the team, I wasn't worried about them. But when you was on the court, I was just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, yo, man, like, you was a killer, man. So Thank you, family. Man, even in the process of that, being young, you know what I mean? It, I just gained a lot of respect for you, man. So I've always been a fan, and it's an honor to, to be on your platform, bro. Thank you, bro. Nothing but love and respect. And we definitely going to get up and break bread soon. Looking forward to it, King.